Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. It is Tuesday night. It is cheese night, and it's time to talk the cheese of Spain. It's lovely to see you, everyone. I understand that the world is beginning to open up, but trust me, Tuesday night, cheese night is going to continue long after COVID is just a tiny wee memory in our past. I'm going, oh, do you remember those days? Go, oh, that's when Tuesday night is cheese night began. Isn't that amazing? And we'll think about it in such a nostalgic way when I was, you know, young and fit and beautiful. Right, let's talk about Tracy. Tracy, come on, Grandmother Tracy. Come on, how are you doing? Well, let's, let's get a better picture. <laughs> oh, oh my Go God. on, be smart. Tell me about your little, little, little baby. Yes, our gorgeous little Matilda is um, beautiful. So she's a week old today and um, absolutely delicious. Sleeps all the time. Just getting used to being in this world, it's like, what the hell's this? Where am I? Because we know, you know, babies are the original cheesemakers, aren't they? That's where the rennet thing happens. So right now, your little baby, Matilda, is making cheese in her tummy with her rennet and her mummy's milk. The best cheesemakers of all. Yeah, definitely. No, she's superb. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for their messages. Well, it's been a pleasure. Everyone has been very excited to hear about her. Yeah. Um, well done, I'd just say, to Alison as well. Alison Puck is one of our your Tuesday Night is Cheese Night followers. Um, mm -hmm. I think she's been on every programme, Charlie, and she passed her she level two. Level two. Well done, yeah. Alison. Yes, well done, which you well can do online. Anybody else wants to follow down because we are all racing to become masters of cheese. I obviously think I'm going to be the first and best, but uh, there is unfortunately stiff competition. So the Master Cheese is there to be added. And if you guys need to know where to train, obviously the Academy of Cheese. I've got a course starting tomorrow, if you're interested, on the 1st. Um, otherwise, there's one I'm doing on the 29th. But we also have Patrick McGregor do some really good cheese webinars. Yep. Uh, uh, we've got Canico, um, but you can do just e-learning if you want to do the e-learning. So lots of good places to study out there. Um, come to the Cheddar Cheese, the best place, the best place. We have to just say as well, we're trucking on with Level 3 and Master of Cheese. So we're working away in the background. Um, it's going to take some time because times are different at the moment and not what we expected. A different, um, you mean really quite hard? Yeah, in terms of patronage, you know, many of our patrons are, are, are the bigger wholesalers whose markets have disappeared. Mm -hmm. So funding is going to be tight for the next sort of 12, 18, 24 months. So we're going slow, but it's all progressing. Level three, master yeah, of cheese. We have a I'm, plan. I'm penciled in to do the, the module on tasting, which is about sensory analysis. So I am absolutely looking forward to that. That's going to be my thesis, which is part of why my journey to be a, a, a master of cheese. So, you know, it's all going down. Now, one of the things they're going to be able to learn at level three, though, is there's going to be a module on Spanish cheeses, which is very no, exciting. Definitely. Yeah, which yeah. is a perfect segue to, let's get Rupert in. Rupert, it's a pleasure. Welcome. Hello there. Hi, good evening. Hi. <laughs> well, Grace, well, you, Rupert, and how important he is to us? So, well, uh, yes, welcome, Rupert. Um, Rupert is one of our, uh, is from Brindisa, and they are a patron of the Academy of Peace and have supported us with um, funding and um, knowledge and seminars all about Spanish cheese. Um, we absolutely adore Rupert and Monica. We adore Brindisa. When I had my delicatessen many, many years ago, Brindisa were one of my favouritest suppliers of Spanish mm. uh, chorizos and olives and um cheeses and tonight you've got some amazing ones to taste i'm going to duck out and leave you guys to it so enjoy and thank you rupert for um agreeing to come on with charlie no th thank you for inv inviting me i could i can always you know talk about spanish cheese i'm always happy to do that definitely brilliant all right well welcome rupert and goodbye tracy bye all bye. have a good bye. evening bye. right rupert Let's get into this. Let's get into this. Okay. So let, let's get some background. Brindisa, just in case there's people who don't know um, mm -hmm. what you do and how you do it, um, you've got restaurants in London, but most importantly, you're a Spanish importer. Yeah. The, 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 the core of our business is importing 
uh, artisan food from Spain. And then, and then part of what we import is a range of, uh, of, of Spanish artisan cheeses as well. But we also do, you know, like Spanish hams, Iberico hams, olive oils, honeys, mm. pine nuts, one of my favorites, saffron. Yeah, you, your kitchen must be a heaven. Thank you. <laughs> we've, we've been eating very well recently, yes. Yeah. Um, so, you, I mean, I've been to your um, um, uh, your, your maturing rooms. You've got these yeah. bespoke maturing rooms down in in South London with wonderful, and they just look so Spanish. Those those tile type brick uh, under on to create the right space for you to bring your yeah. cheese. Yeah, yeah. Because we decided to, you know, well, quite a few years ago now, we decided we wanted to. To make sure that all our cheeses had natural rinds, or as many as possible of our cheeses had natural rinds. And in order to do that, we needed to have to improve the conditions in which we could could keep our cheeses to 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 help the rinds to, to grow and to survive. Yeah. I mean, why? I mean, apart from Manchego, which we're going to get onto in a minute, why do you think the British awareness of Spanish cheeses is not as high as we are with the French and the Italians and the you know? Because you don't see as much Spanish cheese here uh, beyond Manchego. Well, uh, I mean, I think Spanish cheese is, is, is quite, uh, until very recently, in, even in Spain, a lot of Spanish cheese were very regional and it would be very unusual to find, say, cheese from Asturias in the north down in, in Valencia. Uh -huh. but, um, and so I think even with, within Spain, the knowledge of, of regional cheeses wasn't that, wasn't that extensive. Although that's really changing now because there's this massive artisan cheese movement going on, um, you know, throughout Spain, really. Well, like yeah, we yeah, like we've yeah. got here, trying to sort of save it before it's gone, kind of thing. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a whole series of people kind of moved back in, out, and they left the cities basically, moved back into the countryside, and uh, started reviving uh, traditional recipes and trying, yeah. you know working with rare breeds as well. I, I I wouldn't surprise me if we don't get another wave after COVID, particularly in the UK, of people going, I am done with the cities that you know i do not want yeah. to be in this flat all over again for any number of months if I'm, I'm putting the quality of life now before 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 the quality of my work yes i'm i'm very tempted as well i i I, mm. I i often daydream about you know some goats somewhere up in the mountains it seems quite appealing <laughs> that to that's me. a good question where would you go where would you go me Poo. I, I i'd like there's a mountain range in, in rioja that I really like the sound of. It's because it's still quite close to the north coast yeah. of Spain. So it's, you, you get a nice bit of rain there. So it's relatively green and, you know, similar greenness to, to the UK perhaps. And, uh, but then you're right next to Rioja, which is always yeah. good. And, yeah, uh, I'm yeah. myself, but I'm going to take your word for that one. Now I was, uh, I used to read a lot of Hemingway and there are some stories of, of him fishing up against the south edge of the Pyrenees sort of yeah. travel dreams and, and amazing wines and that kind of thing and with a nice combination a little bit of mountain air but but, but hot as well so i have to say i'm going there when when, when it all goes pear-shaped i'm coming with you i'll be a bit yeah. north by yeah, yeah right no, totally totally you've got three cheeses for us guide okay. us through where are you going to start well let's start um we've got uh, the first cheese is is this one which is uh san moor which is the, the moluengo which I've, mm -hmm. I've cut in half and right. uh, well, you wonderfully sent me one here so i'm going to put this up to the camera so people can see mm -hmm. so first first impressions people wouldn't necessarily know this wasn't a sand more it's a little bit um uh less dry on the rind than a sand more might be a little bit yeah. white perhaps uh, and it feels like it's about 20 percent heavier as well maybe 30 percent heavier yeah it is yeah because th these ones a sand more is normally about 250 grams and these are about 320 Okay, but it's still got the um, the straw going through the middle. It's come on, focus, yeah. my friend. Yeah, yeah. and you know, and that's about the fact that these are quite fragile in their youth yeah. and a little bit of sport. Yeah, because if if you pick them up by one end, they can break in half basically. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what happens. So that, so the, the the straw is like a, a spinal column. So is this a structure to it? Is the is the a traditional recipe for its area, or is it? Uh, no, no is it... not at all. No, because this cheese is made in La Mancha. Okay, so it's a it's it's a very unusual lactic goat's cheese made in in uh, in La Mancha, just to the southeast of uh, of Madrid. Okay, so, so I've got a map up, people. 
So here's Madrid up over in the sort of, you can sort of see as the big city on the screen. Um, now there's a wonderful uh, park here that I'm going to mispronounce. You're going to translate it for me, Rupert. Tocas de la de Palanceras y Tierra Muerta. Yes. Right. I mean, yeah, no, no. It says something. It's something to do with uh, uh, you know the, the lands of the dead, basically. I'm, I'm afraid I, <laughs> I I don't know it. I haven't been there, so so I can't. Okay, well that's pretty cool. But, but, um, but I will Google. I'll look it up on Google Images and, and see what's uh, okay. What's going that on. is the La Mancha region, isn't it? Now this this area down Cuenca, that kind of area. Yeah. No, it is. Yeah, just kind of south of Cuenca is is, is the area of La, of, of La Mancha. And uh, okay. that's where, where both the Armanchego that we're going to try today comes from. And a little bit further to the east is where the Moluengo comes from. Okay. Okay. Let's let's put that map away just at the moment. Yeah. And uh, and yeah. let's... So, so what is the environment down there? I mean... Well, that's one of the things that's... Uh, right? Yeah. It's one of the things that's intrigued me about, about the Moluengo because it, it's a cheese that's only been made you know, probably for, for the last 10 years, I should think maximum of the last 10 years. And uh, in a lot of Europe, the, the price of milk has, has, uh, has been very low recently. So if a lot of producers of milk decided to go, a lot of farmers, goat farmers, decided to go into cheese production to get more value from, from what, they were, what they were working with. And so José Luis, who, who makes Moluengo, taught himself to become a cheesemaker and taught himself, he decided to do the San, uh, a San Moore recipe, but to try to do it in a, in a Spanish way. So he's using a different breed of goats, the Murciano Granadina goat. And uh, he's also making it several, several hundred kilometers further south than, than where San Moore is, is made in, in France. So it's a, a more mm -hmm. Mediterranean, uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a harsher climate. And also what, uh, what um, Jose Luis does is he, he selects the, the goats which he milks well but from all of his goats he like he milks all his goats every day and part of that milk he sells off but then he selects certain goats that are that are the healthiest goats and when those goats are milked he separates off that milk and uses that preserves that for making for making the cheese with. Yeah. and so it's one of those things the, wow. he's the, the size of his dairy is is but basically, it's, it's, it's the converted garage on the side of his house, which he's just like clad, <laughs> cladded in plastic and put a massive refrigeration unit on it and uh, turned it into into a, into a like into a totally modern dairy. And, I was uh, I was visiting a dairy um, in the north side of the Pyrenees, on the French side, in in, in Laurent, where the one of the Osso uh, areas. Yeah, and uh, guy, what you described is exactly the same as this guy. It basically, was an old fashioned cauldron, round cauldron, and in his converted garage, he had an open flame, like a gas burner, going under yeah. his cauldron. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Small yeah. production. Spends his time basically on the hills, looking after his his animals. That's where he's at. Yeah. Comes back, make cheesing, and 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 does does, does this does this guy mature his own cheeses on? I'm assuming that this is probably a 20 day cheese by the time he wants it out of his store. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way, the way we work it is because it takes about a week to travel from 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 Spain to England. It leaves yeah. his it leaves his dairy about 14 days and reaches us at about 21. Okay. And then and then we take it when it arrives. We take it out of the boxes and and put it into our cheese rooms. To let it let the rinds dry if there's been condensation, or, and uh, just to let the the geotrichum begin to to kind of grow again. Yeah. So tell us what flavors we should be looking for. Well, for me, I always think when I'm when I'm eating these these kind of creamy Spanish goat's cheeses, it just, it just reminds me of the, of the kind of herbs, that kind of herby pasture that you get in the centre of Spain. For me, this one, this is quite a young um, Moruengo. So for me, it's like really yogurty, very, very lactic. Mm. But not too goaty, do you find? No, not at all. Um, I'm actually enjoying it enormously. You were saying before we came on that when he makes these, because he's so much further south, he has to draw more moisture off, mm. um, make the cheese um, mm. more than you would for a San Moor. And I'm saying I cannot... I'm not recognizing that and tasting this cheese. I'm getting a lot of moisture. It feels very creamy and I'm enjoying that. I love, I'm getting that as, as a great pleasure. I'm getting a, 
as I am getting that herbaceousness you're talking about, and I'm definitely mm. getting the yogurt and the lactic. I would add to that, I've got an astringency, a really kind of like a resinous um, mm. uh, element that's getting it almost like it's getting into the gums of my teeth, if you mm. see what I mean. Is that something that you're getting and that's typical? Because it's really yeah. pronounced very vegetal in that sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, for me, there's one of the words that. that in, used in France to describe that uh, Mediterranean ecosystem called um, Garigue, mm. or in Spanish is um, Gariga, which is that kind of a low scrub, like kind of resinous low yep. scrub yep. that you yep. get. And uh, but those those are the things that I that I that's the kind of taste that I get from this. As well. Okay, so so we, so one of the things that we're about to encounter in our last cheese is the the Cardoon thistle, that classic Spanish rennet style of using the cardoon mm. um mm. is this using that it doesn't feel like it is to me no 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 this is this is um uh, it's, well, it's a lactic cheese but it's with a tiny bit of animal rennet in it just to okay. kind of guarantee the process yeah so it's yeah. probably a 24 to 48 hour set um 48 uh, hours yes. it's for 48 yeah. hours yeah, yeah. so yeah. so you're, you're probably using a starter you're holding it at a temperature where the bacteria are going very slowly through to 48 hours and getting this sort of gentle, slightly curdy lactic set that you're Yeah, doing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And this is really an example of, of a new Spanish cheesemaker. And for years, people only ever did traditional Spanish recipes mm. and with the new, these new fashions in, in Spain of, of uh, the, the new desire to explore cheese, people have started developing new recipes. Well, we've gone from the new, talking of Spanish classics, Numero de, or should I say, uno dos? It's yes. the man where you've got a second. Yeah. So here we've got a, a, a wedge of our uh, uh, a raw milk manchego with a natural rind. So it's an artisan manchego, which um, uh, comes from our uh, a dairy that we buy from in near near Cuenca. And uh, and this dairy is also is one of the few artisan areas that I know of that, that makes uh, the cheese with the vegetarian rennet because they, they changed about a year ago with, and uh, and uh, I think so when, you aware, when you mean vegetarian rennet are we, are we now talking the thistle or is this just no, a non mi microbial rennet a microbial rennet yeah just like the, the same kind of rennet that would be used vegetarian rennet that would be used in the UK mm -hmm. mm. I know it's kind of a strange thing to say but I always get an almost sherbet smell off some of these sometimes. It really. Mm. Yeah. 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 I mean, for me, I just love the smell of the, of the, the, the sheepiness, the lanolin mm -hmm. and the freshness of it. Mm. Manchego is amazing cheese. This is amazing cheese. Um, I, it's often quite difficult for me to explain sweetness because a sheep's milk cheese is classically sweet, but not sweet mm. in a sugar. And in mm. terms of actually having oses, lactoses, any of the oses, the amount of O's in here is tiny. There's no lactose. There's nothing of any significance. So yeah. where's the sweetness coming from? Why is it tasting almost, you know, not quite sherbet but that kind of... I've, I'm just, I, you know, I just don't know, to tell you the truth. For me, it's just something that I've always, I just expect from, from like really good mm. used milk cheeses. It's just that they're going to have this kind of, incredible i mean it's kind of sweetness but it isn't a sugary sweetness at all no, is it not at all something it's just like a really concentrated like caramelly yes toasted, you know yeah. kind of slightly burnt you know burnt well not burnt milk but that kind of mm -hmm. you know car basic yeah. caramelly flavor yeah. and condensed milk kind of mm. verging on toffee um That's that kind toffee. Of, mm. yeah toffee. we were tasting the other day a really good pecorino asado, which is going to be what mm. six or seven hundred kilometers east of here, but probably very much on the same re yeah. um, latitude. Is that the right one? Yeah. Latitude. Um, and it had the same, slightly different because it's much more sort of olive oily, if you know what I mean. But it's um, yeah. that same sweetness at its core that makes a really yeah. good sheep's milk cheese at age taste so mm. good. Mm. And also because they're kind of they're, because they're pressed for for uh, you know. For about four or five hours that mm. also just you know it takes all the moisture out they they're brined for 24 hours they're pressed for, before that they're pressed for about five or six hours 
and, uh, and so you get this kind of really firm kind of dry you know cheese but it's still creamy it's still got this kind of like softness when it breaks down in the, on the palate mm. Mm. and with these cheeses i love the way if you put it in the top of your mouth and then just not so much chew it but just swirl your moisture your your saliva into it and roll it across mm. it up this and very much sort of creamy kind of juice the juice of cheese you know and it, it really is delicious i mean there's a lot of aromas in the cheese i mean do you t can you taste kind of like you know rosemary or something like that in there that kind well, of you're aroma. doing that you was like now you've said it i'm going of course i can I'm going, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he hadn't said rosemary <laughs> um, but i know what you mean but it's yeah. not really with the um uh, with the plant there's no stem there's no um there's no branch in the rosemary it's just that high level um oil of rosemary if you, if mm. you see yeah. Mm. yeah 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 so it's Rupert, almost, i was gonna say it's almost like lardy as well like the texture oh, yeah. if you, you know the the feeling of the of the cheese when it's warm on your on your fingers mm. is, is something you know there's something lardy about it as well and you also get with these sheep's milk cheeses, um, and it's true of many sheep's milk cheeses from Spain too, when they become at age, particularly if they're warm, slightly oily, which is a bit like the large you're talking yeah. about. And I always yeah. think that they have a, a sense of almost like a walnut oil element to them. That obviously not oil, but that mm. oil begins to accumulate inside the cheese. So when you yeah. open it, it almost like it's it, it bleeds that oiliness. If you, if yeah, you yeah. I mean, one of the things that I always pair with. Um, Spanish cheeses is, is olive oil. I always have, mm. I always put like a little, little bit of bread, olive oil on it, and then the Spanish cheese. I find olive oil just pairs amazingly for bringing out mm -hmm. the flavors of the, of the cheese. So um, for those of people who don't know that are listening, talk to um, us about the grades of Manchego, because there is a formal aging grading system, isn't there? Ah, oh, well, yes. So, well, there's the two, the two main kinds of Manchego that you can get in, in the UK. Uh, the ones which is called the semi curado, which is from like two months to four to five or six months, which is semi curado, and then the curado, which is what we're having today, which means basically it's like semi mature and mature. And so curado is has to be over six months, so curado can be between six months and a year. And those are the two most common forms that you'll find in the UK. And then and beyond are... that, there's like añejo, which is like between one and two years old. Uh -huh. And then younger than that, uh, below two months, you get a hoven, which is a young cheese, which is a kind of white, a white, uh, more kind of slightly more rubbery, uh, fresh cheese, really. Well, that's one of the interesting things about this cheese, because like are we, are we were doing a contrast with, with, with a crumbly cheese, it was Cheshire as it happened, which is a cheese mm -hmm. that starts off with an open texture where you can see holes between the curds. And as it ages, it becomes more cheddar like and the curd holes close up. But that's yeah. the opposite with uh, with a manchego, isn't it? When you're when you're young, the young cheese that you're talking about, there are no holes or gaps. And I'm going to put up the camera here. As it gets older, you get this the yeah. appearance of these 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 little caves that appear in the manchego. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of the in 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 when you're taught how to cut a manchego in Spain, they always say never to use the cheese wire because as the wire comes down through the cheese. The, the, the paste blocks up the holes and so you want okay. to use a knife so you can see the you know the, the, the and the distribution of the holes within the paste as well so so are the are the holes a sign of quality are they just inevitable can you, can well, you they're, learn they're just a characteristic yes they're characteristic it's a sign that it's the manchego you might be buying another cheese you know, masquerading as a manchego perhaps masquerading <laughs> Um, and before we yeah. before we move on, let, let, let's talk about this 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 most distinctive um, tire track or, or tweed or yeah. herring. Yeah, thing. yeah. I mean, originally, like in in you know in the well in the Middle Ages, and like probably like from Roman times onwards, when people were making cheese, the the, the mould of the cheese was made out of a, a, a woven belt, a belt which was woven out of grasses, and so the belt would be placed on a on a table with a ridge uh, carved into the table that, that, that would hold the belt in place. Then you'd put the curds into this, uh, into the circle formed by, by the belt. And then there's a, a wooden, um, like a circular wooden board with this, uh, you can, if you look here, you can see the, um, the zigzagging mark. And that the, the board, the wooden board originally has that zigzagging mark 
um, carved into it as well. And so the the, the re nowadays all the, all the molds are made from uh, plastic. They're all kind of hygienic, kind of, you know, modern modern molds. Mm -hmm. But they, as part of this, the sign of the manchego cheese is is to have this um, uh, uh, design on the on on the rind. And I was speaking to uh, a, a friend of mine who who, who makes cheeses in Extremadura and he was saying like, one of the reasons why because when you go to Spain and, and if you go into a supermarket or any cheese shop you'll see cheeses with this with this uh, rind that have mm. got nothing to do with manchego mm -hmm. so when people used to migrate with their sheep you know across the central plains of Spain that in the summer months they'd go up into the mountains and, and meet up with other shepherds who come from other regions of Spain and so while they were on the summer pastures these shepherds would swap recipes and then go back to their own regions and then and then and use that same recipe in those areas which is why you get these very similar looking cheeses across spain because they the cheesemakers would learn how to make those cheeses up in the mountains in the summer mm -hmm. and then go back to their regions and, and then spread the word the well it's interesting okay. you, should, you should bring us on to extra madura but yeah. that's where we're going next now um i'm going to bring our map back up so okay. I don't know if you can see this, people, but Extra Madura is down in this region here, sort of a butt Portugal. And I am reliably informed it is the least populated region in the whole of Europe. Did you know that, Ruben? Well, I can, be, I can believe it, actually. Although I, th I think La, La Mancha is, uh, is quite close. When, when, we went, when we went to visit, uh, we were there in October, and a friend of mine who was with us said he saw more people crossing the road in London Bridge than he did in three days in La Mancha. Really? So it's, I think, and Extremadura is probably about the same, yeah. yeah. Well, so, it um, it's, can be hot, I take it. Well, the reason it's called Extremadura is because it means, it basically means extremely hard. So in the summertime, especially these and, days, you can get temperatures, you know, up to 45 degrees now. Uh, you know, traditionally, temperatures would be, you know, in the mid, in the mid 30s. Then in the winter time, mm. it can go down to you know minus ten, something like that. I mean, the 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 te temperatures really drop, so you get these forty five degrees. Forty five degrees would knock me over. I get to thirty degrees, and I'm beginning to think I'm I've, I've had enough of summer. I was the guy last week complaining that that was I've had enough summer now. That's that's too hot. Yeah, anymore. yeah. I mean, the, the um, Spanish friends of mine who live in, in that area. The, the, they do, you know, one friend of mine said, you know, it got to three o'clock in the afternoon and he just said, look, I'm going to see you at seven. I'm, 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 I need to sleep now. It's just too mm. hot. And they just, they, mm. they just go home and stay indoors. All right. So, Let's get on to the Torta de Barros. So the Torta de Barros is a, is a particular kind of cheese, which is uh, um, kind of, it's, it's part of Extremadura and cheese culture. One of the things that's, that's really unusual about this cheese is that it's, it's made with a, a rennet which comes from the flower of, of thistles. And so a lot of cheesemakers, most traditional cheesemakers, will harvest thistle flowers in at this time of year, more or less like, uh, like May, June time, harvest the thistles. And they, they get the, the purple flower and the little pistils, the purple flower, and then and dry them off. And then from that purple flower, you can make an infusion which has the 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 rennet enzyme in it that helps the curds and the way to, to separate mm -hmm. and so in the kind of 1980s this cheese originally was was regarded as an inferior cheese and was used to be given to the shepherds in in lieu of payment whereas the cheeses that went hard inside like a like a manchego like one of these were, they were, that's what they were trying to make and every now and again they'd come out like this and no one could work out why okay. And then there was uh, a traveling gastronome in the 1980s suddenly tried one of these defective cheeses and uh, and realized it was the most amazing thing, which only the, you know, the shepherds were being kind of fobbed off with. But no one could work out how to make it on purpose. Because so it only, it, only, it only it, ever happened by accident. So this is so, a relatively new cheese then? It, it's, it's recognition is, is really new, yeah. It's recognition is... You know, in the last you know 30 years since yeah definitely in the last 30 years yeah and then it's really swept spain as a kind of totally like fashionable you know uh, typically spanish cheese which has been rediscovered 
But, 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 it, but what people what people think is it is, is one of the aspects of this cheese which is quite interesting. It comes from that part of Spain which used to be part of the, of the kind of Moorish kingdoms. And the thing about this cheese is it's made with a, veg, uh, with a vegetarian rennet, with a vegetable rennet. So it doesn't, it becomes uh, halal and kosher okay. as well. Because kosher, like a kosher uh, cheese, is, you know, you can't get a kosher cheese if it's made with animal rennet because of the religious uh, uh, food laws. Well, lack yeah. of the and so yeah. it's possible that this recipe actually dates from, from, from that period of, of, of in the Middle Ages. That's a really interesting take. So, so let me just wrap that up. I mean, we're speculating because you don't have this as a fact, but the, yeah. the, the prevalence of cardoon thistle cheeses in Spain could be an Islamic influence. It could be the fact that the Islamic influence in Spain is, was very, very strong and it's, it's a kosher, um, halal version of cheese. That's a really interesting idea. Yeah. No, no, no. Because in, 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 uh, in, in the villages, in the village where they make this cheese, on, on the corner of the church, there's the old mm. minaret, which is a thousand years old, which is okay. sticking, out, sticking out the side of the church. So it's it's a very for me it was very vivid so anyway that that's, I, I like the, the imagery of it and that's I, I agree that I agree yeah. right no, but 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 as we much as we like the history and the religion and and the provenance uh, this is such a fascinating flavored cheese so let's 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 hear what you've got to say about this one okay so one of the things about about veg well th the thistle rennet is it's it's a little bit unstable. Nobody knows how strong it is because when they're making Not the infusion, I don't see it as a problem. Well, that's the thing, but that's why you get these like th these different flavors, like from from the edge of the cheese to the middle of the cheese. There's, okay, there, it, it can taste different. Okay. Mm. okay. So yeah. let me just. So this kilo, that, sorry, this cheese is about 600, 500, 600 grams, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, am I right in saying that it is a washed rind cheese? I mean, it's not a washed rind cheese as in bacteria ripen, but they do wash it, don't they? They keep, they really make sure the, the rind stay, stay, stay down. So part of the, the way that this cheese is made is, is the high moisture. And so, the, so although this is a wash, it, I mean, it is a washed rind cheese and it's got the, the linens on, on, on the outside. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, is when the cheese is made, it comes out, you know, it's a hard, it looks like a hard cheese. It's just as, as, as solid as a, as a, as a manchego would be. But when it goes into the maturing rooms, the maturing rooms have got an incredibly high humidity and, uh, the, and the planks are washed in a way that doesn't destroy the natural ecosystem of, of, uh, of yeast and bacteria that grow on the planks. And so the planks inoculate the rind of the cheese. And it's over, because this cheese is actually, uh, when, when it leaves Spain, it's 45 days old. So this is a semi-cure cheese, which used to be oh. hard and has gone soft. So it's actually, so having gone to that effort to take all the moisture out, you then use the maturing rooms to put some of it back in again. Well, kind of. And also, I mean, what happens, what, what the thistle run it does, it breaks down the, the chains and the amino acids. So it just breaks down the structure of a cheese. So this is really a hard cheese, which has gone soft. Rather so, than a... And like the cheese has gone softer and softer. So it's a cousin to something like a Morbier, which is likewise a hard cheese that well, quite achieves, yes. achieves that elastic, rubbery texture. This is much rubbier than a, than a, than a Morbier. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. jerk. Makes sense. I, mean, yeah. I mean, looking at it, the other, there's lots of things about this cheese that I think are fascinating. Um, you do get a real sense of vegetation in it, but I always think that you mm. taste what you might consider to be fermented alcohol as well you know they're there is whiny, uh, aren't they yeah they're very whiny in that sense um and mm. you feel that you know with the right wine it would be quite explosive and then the other and with, sorry the wrong wine it could go horribly wrong with the right wine it would be very balanced in in a, in a, in yeah, a good way yeah i mean i must say i really like it with with cava actually i find okay. that the bubbles of the cava with the uh with the softness of the paste uh just work really well together I don't know if I'm the only person listening to you thinking that I've been calling it Carver for all these years, and apparently that is now wrong. It? It's now Cava. Okay. Yeah, no, Cava, Cava, yeah. Cava. Okay, I will be corrected. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, uh, these have been fascinating. That's fascinating. I mean, I think the Torta de Cada. Uh, there's the Torta de Queza, Torta de Queza, Queza. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, they're different. They're all tortas, 
and they all come from a very similar region in Extremadura. But mm -hmm. at some point, when uh, the recipes were being kind of formalized, different uh, DOPs were established. And so the villages, mm -hmm. I, I think they're you know, less than 40 kilometers apart. Okay. The, the, I, I, in my opinion, the recipe is very similar. And uh, yeah, there's, they, there's also they're, a, lovely, they're, a lovely story of uh, the princess from this region being uh, married into somebody in Portugal. And you've got those two cheeses in Portugal that are similar in style, which uh -huh. is where, uh, the Serra de Estrella and the Azieto. Um, Azieto, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, but uh, yeah. which is a bit smaller, but again has this sort of wet, washed rind, but not washed rind character. Yeah. And then the they're stick. held together with the, with the lace as well. That goes mm -hmm. the that's right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. maybe that's what you're talking about, the shepherds meeting for, for, for a bit of a summer mountain yeah. retreat. and spreading recipes. Yeah, sort of the cheese equivalent of Davos, is that what we're saying? Definitely, yeah. It's like the, it's like the shepherds and goat herds, you know, summit. You know, I think we, we, should, we, should, we should reinvent that. We should reinvent that. We should we should have a cheese sort of symposium up some mountain in uh, yeah. in Spain. Once yeah, we come, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. No, totally, totally. Okay, well, cheese <laughs> loving people out there, that's it. When COVID's toast and we're all allowed to travel again, let's go and do a a cheese swapping knowledge seminar in the mountains of Spain. I think that would be absolutely awesome. Um, so thank you very much for coming on, Rupert. How are you getting on with your restaurants in uh, in Bar Market and the like? Are you opening? Well, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, next week, basically, we're going to start opening all our restaurants. Uh, at the moment, the, the, our restaurants in Bar Market and our Battersea restaurant, they're open and, and they've been doing takeaway for the last uh, couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And then gradually, depending, again, depending on, on, on the numbers of people who are moving around, uh, we'll gradually uh, uh, introduce our, our normal menu. Have you have you had any problems with a lack of social distancing? I mean, the Spanish aren't known for their for their social distancing in a normal circumstance. Yeah, well, uh, neither neither are <laughs> neither are the English either. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, no, 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 we have base basically. Uh, mm. I think it's the there's like an enthusiasm of like coming out, meeting people, especially in the last few days, standing out in the sun, having yeah. having a, a, you know a cool beer. And the pure chat. pleasure of holding a good beer, eating some manchego in the sunshine. I mean, social yeah. distancing is, is out the window then. You know, it's, it's, it's getting it's jolly. Hard, and, yeah. hard to remember, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally, yeah. yeah. Well, on that note, uh, Rupert, thank you so much for coming on. Um, yes, will thank you, you for inviting me. Can, will you come back and talk about some of the other Spanish cheese regions? Yes, no, it would be very good. Very interesting indeed. To, we could do mountain cheeses or Pyrenean cheeses, something like that. Well, I'm seeing some uh, some, some some chat about Cabralith uh, and Picos de Europa. Uh, what's yep. that one? Uh, Queso de Flor de Gaua. Do you deal with the um, Canary Island cheeses at all? Ah, well, we've had a lot of talks with people in the Canary Islands over the last kind of 10 years. And, uh, yeah. but, 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 it, it, it's a little bit more complicated to, to bring it over than than than, 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 than it seems. It is. But there's, there's some well, there's extraordinary cool. cheeses there. Really extraordinary. Awesome. I've yeah. tasted them. We did a fantastic. Um, uh, there was a World Cheese Awards there once, and I did a tour of some of the cheese makers. Um, it's amazing to think of such a, in fact, a tiny group of islands having such a deep cheese history. Yeah. No, no, totally. I mean, it, it, they're kind of like each each valley has its own. You know, if you imagine each island is basically a volcano with with valleys, you know, leading off down either side, and each valley has its own ecosystem and its own kind of recipe, really, for cheese. So it's, cool. it's, it's, the number of the cheeses in the Canary Islands is extraordinary, really extraordinary. Um, I had a question. Can you just reconfirm which manchego we are tasting? Okay, so this is this is the cured manchego. It's a it's a raw milk cured manchego from uh, near near Cuenca, and it's a it's a dairy called uh, Villarejo. Okay. Which is and uh, you, you think that, that that's the name of the, of the dairy? So because in La Mancha, I mean there are there are hundreds of dairies making making manchego cheese, and uh, mm -hmm. I suppose it's a question of finding one one that you like that, that you know out of, out of what's on offer. Well, sometimes it's a question of finding just avoiding the one you don't because there's lots of good ones out there. Well, right, yes, yeah, Rupert. 
I'm going to release you back into the wild. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, uh, Thank you very much. Everybody uh, who's so it's been a lovely show, and we're going to bring more cheese to the UK. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, then. Bye now. Bye-bye. Right. What a lovely man that is. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Brindisa do a fantastic book. Here we go. The tr True Food of Spain. Uh, really good. It's good. Anything you want to know about Spanish stuff, it's in here. Woohoo. Uh, so recommended that. That tells you all about Spanish cheeses as well. So who have we got next week? Um, that's going to be rather embarrassing. I completely forgot. Never mind. I'll put it on the web. You guys can come on anyway, and we will talk awesome cheeses in an awesome way, uh, as is our word Tuesday night's cheese night. Um, just to put a little bit of something, we are going to be working with the Virtual Cheese Awards a little bit. They've got, uh, they've taken the opportunity to, uh, I don't know, get some attention back onto the small cheese makers, and they're doing a really cool thing in July, which we'll be telling you more about. There's an opportunity for you to win. There's some cheeses that are going to be winning their awards, so stay tuned for that. Apart from that, sign up to the Academy of Cheese, come and do our courses, keep us in business, eat good cheese, drink good wine, and have a wonderful time. Uh, so lots of love from me, lots of love from them, and 